right. Welcome here, everybody. Nice to see so many people here. Uh, I'm actually one of the regulars at this uh, this uh, uh, meetup. Uh, it's just uh, I'm not so fast as clicking the register button, so so I regularly don't come. The last time I was here, I think it's been twice, perhaps. Uh, I was a speaker uh, for five years ago or something. Um, um, just so you know. Right. So so since then, I, I defended a thesis and 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 got to know a few things and, and I'll try to to um, I'll try to, to rub some of it uh, together and and uh, and uh, talk about it today um, so my thesis was about uh, representation learning for natural language and uh, uh, how many of you a quick raise of hand uh, are here because you're interested in language a few of you good uh, how many of you are here because you're expecting something about vision or images or, or, or stuff like that? Right. All right. So many people with, with some language interest here. That's, that's great. We'll try to talk a bit about that. Uh, so, yeah. Right now, I'm heading this uh, research group here in Gothenburg, uh, Deep Learning Research Group at Research Institutes of Sweden. Uh, we do, uh, we're, we're part of AI at RISE, uh, which is uh, 60 or so researchers spread over Sweden uh, in Stockholm, Gothenburg, Linköping, Västerås, Luleå, Lund, I think. There may be some other places as well. Uh, many, many people uh, among the 3,000 or so people at RISE. Uh, we have projects with industry, with public authorities, with healthcare uh, hospitals, and uh, with academia. Uh, we do both applied data science and more foundational machine learning research. And, uh, and uh, we're, sometimes we're funded by the partners and sometimes we're funded externally by research fun funding. Uh, we, in our group here, we're a handful of people, uh, we have these recurring seminars every Thursday at 3. They're open to the public, you're very much welcome. Uh, this Thursday, <coughs> our colleague John Martin Martinson, he's not here today, he will talk about uh, adversarial representation learning for, for privacy applications, which is something that we'll get to in the end of the, of the talk today. I'll mention just briefly uh, what this is. Uh, and if you get really bad, you know, problems for not having pizza, just just tell me before you faint or so, and and we'll try to have a break or give you some water or something, or air. I don't know. Right. Let's go. We'll roll back a few steps and talk a bit about foundations of machine learning. Um, so for this, we had this nice data set. Uh, that I will uh, show you some of the foundations, uh, uh, foundational uh, aspects of. Uh, we'll focus on supervised machine learning today, and so we'll not mention much about other, other, um, other kinds of machine learning. Uh, this means that our training data are these, these pairs. So we have the input x and we have the, the target associated with the, with the input y. And the x is some number of features describing a data point, and we're trying to make our model predict the y's. So we train our model to predict the y's. So the y's is the, the correct target. Um, for example, in this, in this case, we have two features. Uh, we have the weight of the object that x represents, and we have the length of the whiskers. In this case, uh, the object is some animal, uh, it may be this guinea pig, or it may be this cat, and uh, the target, the Y, is this class, uh, <coughs> or the category that the, that the animal belongs to. Um, now we see all this, this data spread out uh, in the space, uh, described by these two uh, features. So some animals have this short whiskers, some animals have longer whiskers, some are, are not so heavy and some are more heavier. And that, that is what, what our algorithms, uh, algorithm will see. <clears throat> and then we train it to predict uh, the blue or the, or the red point. 
uh, once we train it. So some uh, strategies for this may be to start simple and we can add some decision boundary. For example, this, this uh, vertical line, which may, means that we're, we're, we're not looking at weight. Weight's not important here uh, for some reason. We're just look, looking at the whiskers length. And then we can find the optimal place for such a, such a decision boundary. And uh, it will have some errors. There will be some cats on one side and there will be some guinea pigs on the other side, probably. But it does a decent job. I think it gets 70 or 80% in this case with these, this um, toy example, fake data. I did make the data up. It's, I did not go out and collect it. It's not real. It's not real people here. We don't have a privacy issue with, with these points. Uh, we could do it the other way around. We could look at only the weight, um, find some place to divide the data here. We'll get some uh, spurious points, um, but it will do an, an okay job. Um, this is actually something that we would call underfitting. We have a classifier that is a bit too simple. Um, we could try to do something more sophisticated, of course. We could do something like this, and, and we have a decision boundary that perfectly matches the training data. And what is the problem with this? Well, the, the problem is, is this. If we get some unseen data point, uh, it seems like it has the whiskers of a, of a cat, but probably has the weight more matching, matching this animal, the guinea pig. <clears throat> Um, so, so, so this one uh, would be an example of the overfitting because it matches the training data very well, but as soon as, as we get uh, a blue point here or a red point here, um, it will be misclassified. So it will not generalize well. And that is the problem with, with an overfitting, uh, with a model that overfits. Um, so we may end up with something that looks like this if we're looking for, for a linear classifier, uh, which may be a good, good uh, thing to look for in this case because it looks uh, reasonably well separatable uh, and we get some errors, but perhaps not as many as we got with, a, with just looking at the whiskers or just, just the weight. Uh, so this is an example of, of the Occam's razor uh, principle where we should look uh, among the classifiers that, that work well here, we should look for one, one that's <clears throat> that is simple. Uh, and in general, that is also one that generalizes well. Um, so later today, I'll talk about uh, machine learning models that are <clears throat> much more sophisticated uh, and uh, that has a much larger representational capacity. And uh, you could imagine that we're looking for this, this holy grail of, of some machine learning model that, that can solve any task at any data. Uh, but the no free lunch theorem for, for machine learning uh, states that, that it's not doable. We cannot find uh, this, this super machine learning that solves everything, every task for every data set possible. Uh, so we should instead look for, for a model that has a decent amount of bias and still can vary uh, enough to fit the data in a reasonably uh, good manner. So we're trading off these, these things. We're trading off the variance against the bias and we're trading off the overfitting against the underfitting. And we should, have, we should find a sweet spot there. Right, um, more sophisticated methods. Well, deep learning, hello. Um, a deep learning model, a deep neural network, is this kind of a model where we stack a number of transformations. We generally call them uh, layers. And in such a layer, we make simple transformation. We have the input that is a vector, and it's fed th to the layer where we multiply it with a, with a weight matrix, and we squash it through some nonlinearity. <clears throat> and this transforms the, the vector into another vector. And then we do this over and over for a number of layers, and we get some output. In the beginning, the outputs will be random because we generally initialize the, the weight uh, parameters uh, randomly. 
but we then update the parameters until they get, uh, until it starts performing. That means that, that the transformations is just a function of the data, which means that the, that, the, that the vector that we get out of a layer is a representation of the object that's fed as the inputs here. Here we have the raw features. It could be the whiskers length, it could be the weight with the weight of, of an animal. It could also be uh, the pixels of, uh, of an image, uh, and it could be representations of words or characters um, <clears throat> in, in the sequence of text. But one thing to take away here is that after each of these layers, we have a representation, something that represents the data point that we're looking at. Um, this depth adds representational power, uh, and we can describe increasingly complex functions, increasingly um, um, complex functions. Um, and in the special case of having no hidden layers, we have the linear model uh, that we saw with the cat. We just can find a linear uh, decision boundary. So what are the properties of these representations that we learn to compute? Um, this is uh, visualizations from a convolutional neural network, Zeiler and Vergas, 2013. We have this image of a nice car fed into uh, the neural network layer and uh, activations in the low level of the neural network react to, to simple stuff in the image. So we have diagonal lines, uh, we have some gradients from one color to the other, and we had uh, color patches and simple stuff. As we go deeper into the network, we find a bit more abstract stuff, and the deepest we find stuff that, that can actually look like, almost like it matches real uh, existing things. I'm not sure we see that here, but uh, there, are, there are other examples where we, where we actually can find one activation that activates the most if it looks as, at a cat or, or a human uh, face. Uh, I don't know, it, perhaps it looks like a flower here. Uh, Hubel and Weisel got, got uh, awarded for, for, for finding this in animal brains. Uh, so they call them hypercomplex cells for the deepest ones complex cells for, for some mid uh, activations and simple cells, those are the more, more basic ones. And those are the, the ones <coughs> closer, to the, closer to the visual input uh, of, the, of the animal brain. And these are more deeper into the visual cortex. Right, feel free to, to interrupt me at any time and I'll answer questions. One of the, the nice features about deep learning is that if we just make the network large enough, we can represent any continuous function at arbitrary precision. That is called the universal, universal approximation theorem. Uh, it doesn't really say how we learn it or, or that we can learn it, but, but it can be represented. So that means that, that these models, if we make them large enough, can represent really uh, <clears throat> really sophisticated functions. Right, so this is something that I touched upon earlier. Uh, if we look at the generalization of machine learning model, and we look at its capacity, if we increase the capacity of, of the model, uh, that means that the generalization suffers. It means that, that um, Actually, the, the math says it's some sort of an upper bound of, of yada yada. Uh, but the generalization gap uh, worsens uh, as the capacity increases. This could be a problem with, with large model that, that has a high representation capacity. Uh, but on the other hand, we have this, this um, relationship. As the data size grows, uh, the generalization also improves. So if we can train a large capacity model with large data, that means that we can still have a nice, nice generalization. Generalization, uh, as we saw 
uh, in the cat example is uh, is whether our model performs well on unseen animals, unseen data points. And to measure this, we generally hold out some data uh, to to actually see how well the model performs on this on this uh, data, the test set of the data. Okay. So Gary Cole from from Office Space comes in. That what that's what happens, right? Um, I'm gonna need you to bring more data. Uh, well, yeah, that's that's one thing you could do. Uh, if we want to learn models uh, with high learning capacity, we would perhaps have to go and get some data. But what, what if that's what if that's a problem? What if data is is expensive or or even impossible to uh, to find. Um, there are some, some other options. Uh, we can start with data augmentation. This is something that we often do, at least in vision-related uh, tasks. Uh, we, we run the same image many times, and we modify it in some way. We make it, we make it grayscale, or, or we skew it a bit, or we rotate it a bit, or we add some noise. and and then we run it again. Um, so that is that is definitely one thing that can improve. Uh, that simulates having more data. Uh, it also uh, can lead to generalization. And there are some examples where uh, synthetic data generation uh, can work, uh, but there are issues with synthetic, synthetically generated data. Uh, and it is uh, generally not so similar to, to real data. And that can pose a problem. The final point here is, is kind of where I'm getting. Uh, we could use some other data. But what could that data be? Um, using other data to start out your training is what's called transfer learning. Transfer learning. You start to train. You start to train your model on on one task and one data set, and then you move your 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 model uh, and you continue training on the target uh, task and the target data set. Uh, so that is uh, transfer learning. Uh, it's also also often referred to as as doing pre-training. Uh, we pre-train on some data set, or some task. Uh, and we fine tune it on some on the task that we're, we're, we'd like to be performing well on. Another option is to do multitask learning, and these are really closely related. Uh, multitask learning is to have one model that can actually solve several different tasks. Uh, so in that case, we have some common part of the model, and we have some parts of the model that aren't common. And these can be so so simple as being one neural network layer that are task specific and the rest of the model is, is actually common. And then we can continue training. So it doesn't have to be this, this one step thing uh, where we train, pre-train once and then fine tune. But here we can, we can continually train on both this task and this task. So this has, for example, been shown in, in uh, machine translation uh, where we can train uh, one model for, for several different languages, and it seems to give improvements on under-resourced languages um, up until some, some limit of the, of the number of languages. Right. Questions? Yes? Examples of transfer learning, that, that's where I'm getting. This is an example. Of the transfer learning. Uh, so this is from, from 2014. Uh, these are people at, at KTH, uh, and this has been a really highly cited paper. Uh, this, is the, this, this is the model architecture of, of, of what they're doing in the paper. Uh, so at the time, convolutional neural networks were, they weren't new, but, but it's, it's 2012 when, when uh, um, Krzyzewski presented the AlexNet uh, and so this is 
newish times. Uh, so what they did is they took a, a, a convolutional neural network that was initially trained for image classification on the ImageNet dataset. Then they chopped off the head of this convolutional neural network. So the final layer, they chopped it off. They used the output before the final layer as being the feature representations for the data. So each data point, uh, the pixel, the raw pixel values are fed into this convolutional neural network. And then they take the, the final representation layer and feed it into a support vector machine. So the support vector machine is, is sort of another example of this final layer. It's just a linear, uh, a linear classifier uh, or regressor um, that can work on this feature representation. This green part here is, is what's the current state of the art for, for, for many different uh, vision tasks at the time. Uh, so, so you did some annotations, you did some DPMs, you learned some normalized pose, you extracted some features, yada yada. Uh, there was a lot of steps and uh, many things that depend on each other, which is not learned end to end. So the convolutional neural network is trained end to end, which means that each of the steps are continually modified so as to become something useful for the next step. In the green path here, uh, this pipeline, uh, each step is more of, a, of an engineered uh, thing that transforms the data in some way, uh, but, it, but then it's fixed. The transformation is fixed, which means that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't change so well when, when, when you, or it's, 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 it doesn't update while you train. Uh, so in this green, green part, um, this is the de development work, and then, and then you train the SVM on that. Right, so this is, this is uh, just a visualization of the ComNet, uh, convolutional neural network. Um, and these are actually activations. The, this is a visualization from, from Karpathy, uh, which, is, which can run in your browser. It's, it's, on, um, <coughs> uh, it's on Stanford's uh, ComNet course webpage. It's really nice. They show another picture, and then you see the, all the all the activations in the network, where you can kind of see that you have the edge detectors here, early parts, and then you have some more abstract things, I suppose, also more low resolution, as you do the the pooling layers and, and stuff. Um, and finally, you get the the classification here. So, what did they come come uh, up with? Uh, Reservian, AL, 2014. Um, these are the results. And they do this for, for a number of, of tasks within computer vision. Uh, so what you can see here are four bars for each task. Um, the first one is best state of the art at the time. That's the green one. And then you get the pink one. That's the, that's the CNN off the shelf, uh, where you have a pre-trained convolutional neural network, and you just run it on this task. The red one is uh, CNN off the shelf, and they do some augmentation of this. Uh, and then they do this uh, support vector machine on, on it. That's the red one. And then you have the, I don't know, is it white or light blue or something? Or is it another, <laughs> another, another uh, a pink one? Uh, that's at least uh, a specialized CNN. So I think the two middle one are, are with the SVM, uh, and the rightmost one is, is the one uh, fine-tuned fine on the task. Um, and the red one here outperforms state-of-the-art in many different tasks. And in some tasks, it's, it's at least somewhat on par with, with in sculpture retrieval, I guess it's a little a little bit worse, but for the other tasks, it's, it's actually outperforming all the, all the traditional methods. Um, the takeaway here isn't that they, that they demonstrate something that works super well. The takeaway here is that the common net that they take that was pre-trained on ImageNet classification, it produces representations, internal representations, that it was just learning to make the final classification those representations work really well 
uh, for many, many different tasks within computer vision. And now for, for <coughs> five years, people have just done this over and over. Uh, for example, semantic segmentation. Uh, this is an example of, of the pyramid, pyramid uh, parsing network uh, where the convolutional network, which could be, I actually don't know which one they're, they're using here, but, but it, it's at least tens of layers, uh, lots and lots of computation that happens, but they just show it using a little tiny box here because it's so insignificant. This is a lot of the computation is done here. So they compute uh, representations, and this is pre-trained, uh, on ImageNet, also here. This was 2016. Uh, and then they add some, some more uh, parts. This is not a support vector machine. This is also a neural network. Uh, so you have com convolutions, and they do this in this pyramid fashion, where you have the large ones and the smaller ones. Uh, and then you have some more comps. Uh, and then finally, you train it to uh, to do the semantic segmentation. And semantic segmentation is, is just classifying each pixel. So each pixel should be classified to its uh, semantic class. So we probably have some, I don't know, some, some traffic sign here, and we definitely have some people. So that should be the, the class of, of human beings. And then perhaps we have some class for, for ground here, and perhaps some class for, for um, trees and stuff. Um, so the representations work really well. In this case, you take them, you add some more logic by, by a larger neural network, and then you fine tune the whole thing. That means that we're measuring the error in our output here, uh, and then we use backpropagation to update all the weights uh, to make it a little bit better in the next time it sees some data. Right, so this is an example of, of, of something that, that we've been doing. Uh, John and I, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very similar model. It, it's also based on the Pyramid network, uh, where we take a pre-trained uh, convolutional network and we fine tune it on, on this fashion uh, data. And, and uh, we get a few more points uh, of accuracy than the current state of the art. Another example is this one. It's from Europe this year. Uh, and this is, this is an example of, 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 uh, of where you take, uh, you take a lot of stuff, and then you add them together, and then you, you, you kind of it becomes really big. Uh, but in this case, it also it has this uh, idea and it actually works well in the end. So what, what they're doing here is 3D pose estimation. <clears throat> and 3D pose estimation for humans, which, which this is, uh, is, is really difficult to get training data because you want, um, you want the whole mesh. I should have an, an image of this. It's a shame. Uh, so you want all, all the the, the, <clears throat> the points of the whole body, uh, not only the pixels where the body stands. You can see there, there's some human here standing in some strange pose. Um, but for, for each position on the body, you should make this, this three-dimensional, uh, where is this part of the body in three dimensions? And that means that you, you have the width of, it's not just a skeleton, it's the whole the whole body. And this is a task where you could really benefit from having a lot of data. And uh, they start out with, with um, an, an idea of using simulated data because we can all generate 3D images. That's not a problem. Um, but it doesn't generalize that well to, to real photos or real videos. Um, <clears throat> So they start out with simulated videos, and then they uh, sort of add this to real videos. Um, with some tricks, they um, make uh, this, this, is, this is a simulated human being. And you can see only, the, only one part of it. 
because it's occluded by something in the in the real image here. I'm not even sure what is what is it in the foreground. I think it's a, it's a large head here, and then there's a sl small human being here. So it doesn't look really real to me. Uh, but apparently, this way of putting together the simulated people with other stuff that are actually real, uh, and then you have some some modules. Uh, <clears throat> the flow estimator. Uh, looks at how things are moving from one frame to the next because we're looking at videos here. So these are video frames. Um, and the 2D key, key points uh, is, is looking at more, <coughs> uh, it's not the dense uh, pose, but it's, it's a more, uh, it's just the key points of, of the skeleton. Um <coughs> and then you train your model on this and, and apparently all this this uh, data engineering uh, ends up with with uh, a lot more accuracy in, in the final result. Right, how am I on time? And when is the pizza coming? Yeah. Pizza, don't know. Okay, so I guess we go on. We'll, we'll handle it. <laughs> Any medical emergencies? No? Okay. Um, so I'm thinking whether we should take a few more of, of, these, of these examples before we go into the... Uh, I, think we'll, I think we'll go to the next, uh, to the next uh, thing here which is language, because there's apparently a, a language crowd here, which is super great. Uh, so I guess many of you know about uh, neural word representations, uh, which is sort of the way that we have been doing uh, transfer learning for, for language for many years. So this means that we look at a text, and for each word in the text, uh, we embed the word with some vector that was computed by some black box model. In the 90s, it was a bag of words representation, which Schütze made with some, some uh, um, it was compressed a bit, so it wasn't uh, just a bag of words. Uh, and then, of course, uh, word to vec in 2013, um, they called it the neural, neural word embeddings, but it's still just a layer, so it's still just a linear projection. Um, there was many more. Glove is one of them. Uh, <clears throat> the point here is uh, that these, these perform really well for a word. Uh, the words are spread out in, in a vector space. We typically have a few hundred, uh, few, few hundred uh, dimensions in this space. And we, when we project it down to two dimensions, we get these nice plots. This is one is from Chris Ola from his blog. Uh, should have added that here for credits. Uh, but we see these nice properties that, that cities are clustered here. Travel-related words are clustered here. Food is clustered here. Uh, we get similarities between words that are soft and, and uh, real-valued. So relatives are, are similar to relatives, but uh, not so similar to traveling and so on. Uh, we also can do nice things such as uh, vector algebra, so we can take one vector, subtract something else, and get a new meaning. The, the famous example is taking the vector for, for the word king, and then you subtract uh, man, and you add woman, and you get to a vector that is very close to the vector that describes uh, queen, which is, I guess is some sort of, of female, uh, female, female kingish thing. Um, right. <clears throat> In comes Bert, or, or not really Bert. I didn't really want to have him there, but he just pops in because he's everywhere. Uh, uh, the T in Bert, because Bert is not the name of this guy, it's, it's an abbreviation. The T in, in Bert is, is for transformer. Transformer was presented in, in the paper Attention is All You Need by Waswani in 2017. 
Uh, but this wasn't when all the fuzz started. All the fuzz started with, with this guy in 2018, because that's when the Google people published their paper, uh, which is just called BERT, I think. And it's an abbreviation of, of I don't know, something something transformers. Um, this is when we start to do deep transfer learning for language. So the transformer uh, initially was evaluated on, on translation, uh, perhaps on other tasks as well. It's a way of modeling language uh, which takes a little bit, a little step away from the recurrent neural networks which was used earlier, um, the word embeddings, in the sense that you can compute much more. It's much more scalable uh, because it's more parallelizable because we don't have this, this bottleneck of the recurrence. Um, so the transformer and the title of this paper, it, it means that we take away uh, the recurrence, that, it, that is the computation at this, this step in the sequence depends on this step. Um, instead, we, we use something called the attention mechanism, which I'm not going to de describe in detail here, but that, depends, that, that means that we have a dependence on all, all the places at all the time, and we can compute uh, dynamically where this happens in the sequence. And this, this has made it possible to train really deep networks that, that, that get really good representations for language. <clears throat> and when we can train something really large, uh, it's also beneficial to have really large data. And for text, at least when we do it unsupervised, we have a lot of it. We can train on, on uh, Wikipedia text, we can train on large news corpora, uh, and we get apparently quite good representations from this. Uh, so. The, the, the kind of the powers, the learning powers of the transformer has been shown uh, both with zero shot transfer learning. That means that we train on one task and then we evaluate it on, on an entirely different task. And apparently it, it, it gets some performance even there. If we also allow it to fine tune on the target task, uh, it, it sort, of, sort of performs really well on, on many different tasks. Um, so these are some of the, some of the examples. Um, either you can do representation learning. Uh, that means that we take the transformer and we apply it to some text and we get some vectors out of it. And then we use this in, in another model. Uh, so in this case, these are master students uh, that was in our group in, in the spring. Uh, they used it in, in a neural network called the Flow QA model. Uh, that was trained to do question answering. Uh, and it, it, the, the addition of these representations in place of the, of the <clears throat> old neural word representations made an improvement of the, of the question answering system. Or you can take the transformer as it is, pre-trained on one task, which is generally uh, the, the masked language modeling task. That means that we give it a lot of text, and then we mask some word, and then we let the model predict this word. And, and that is often how you do the pre-training on, on the summary, on, sorry, not the summary, on the transformer. Uh, so Adele and Victor uh, also did a master thesis on this this spring, but they used it for fine tuning. That means that they take the model and then they tune it for the target task. So they did this for, for uh, automatic document summarization of transcribed uh, podcasts. All right, uh, so one of the most recent things, I think it was last week or so, uh, this XML R, R is for Roberta, and if, if, if uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's this whole field of, of just uh, silly names, um, I guess they're, they're signaling that they are building on the BERT in some way, uh, but hey, we want our own name. So this is from, from FAIR, uh, Facebook AI Research. The original BERT is, is from the Google people, Devlin et al. Um, so Connell uh, published an archive paper just very recently uh, where they pre-train on, on many different languages, uh, and then they fine-tune on one language uh, 
and they get really good performance on some low resource languages <coughs> for several different tasks. Um, and this was for, for named entity recognition and, and translation, and there are a lot of different uh, kinds of evaluations in the paper. Uh, they also saw this, uh, saw that for the under re resource, the lower resource languages, uh, you, get a, you get a better performance when you add languages up to, uh, I think, tons or so. Uh, but for as many languages as 100, you, you see a decline in the performance. All right. Questions? Is there pizza? No, no pizza. OK. <sighs> right? Can you bear with me for a little more? Yep. OK. So this isn't, uh, this isn't vision, and this isn't language. Uh, or is it? I don't know. There are some words here, and, and these could be words. I don't know. These could be pixels as well. Um, the point here is, is these are real people, and uh, uh, they are included in the data set from, from the UZI machine learning repository. Um, and now I'm showing them to you, and apparently this is going on YouTube as well. So, so the right to forget, to be forgotten, I don't know, it's going to be difficult. We'll give it a try. Um, so we have... We have people in a database here, and we have some measurements on these people. We have, I don't know, fever, nausea. Um, this is what's for hepatitis C, I think. Uh, so this is data set to train your model to predict uh, hepatitis. Um, the point of having the data set here is that some medical data may be, uh, may be considered sensitive. And that sort of makes people not want, wanting to share their data. That is an issue for, for data scientists, machine learners, uh, because we want data, right? So how do we get the data? We have to be able to say that our uh, algorithms work in a private way. We're not leaking the information that we, that we shouldn't leak. And one way of defining this leakage is to say, if the data set used by an algorithm <coughs> changes just a little, um, I know, Hamid, you're an expert in this. If it changes just a little, uh, so should the output. So the output cannot change a lot if you change just one data point. Remove one, one human being here or add one human being or change it, it cannot make a big difference in the output of an, of an algorithm. Um, that, is, that is kind of the, the essence of, of differential privacy, uh, which, will, which is what we'll look at in the next few slides here. But machine learning models, um, they need to look at the data, right? They're, they're capturing stuff from the data. Some even say that they memorize stuff from the data. Um, so how do we go about this? How can we, how can we uh, sort of make sure that just the right stuff gets memorized and, and not the rest of it? Well, what is the rest of it? What is it that's sensitive? Uh, we don't want the details about individual data points, right? So we don't want model to, to learn specifics about some specific person in the, in the training data set. For example, Jane Smith has a heart disease. OK, big no-no. We l want to learn general patterns about the data. People who smoke risk getting a heart disease, right? Big no-no, OK. Uh, this is where, we're, where we want to be going. Um, so does deep learning memorize data? Well, in some cases, perhaps, yeah. Um, can we kind of make sure that it doesn't? 
let's see. Uh, there are at least uh, some of these, some of these um, things that go hand in hand. If we generalize well, that should mean that, that we're not looking at specific details about one specific data point. Uh, we should look at general patterns. We shouldn't look at, at specific details. So one proposed uh, architecture for this is the Pate uh, framework. It's just a framework. Uh, so that means that we can, we can uh, plug in any machine learning model that we want here in the, in the blue boxes, I think. I think blue means machine learning or something. Uh, so we have some sensitive training data here. That's the yellow, yellow one. We partition it in n different partitions, one, two, three, n. Uh, and these are disjoint, and that, that's one of the crucial points here. These are disjoint. That means that one, one person, one patient, if this is medical data, is, is at most in one of these at most in one of the partitions. Now, uh, we train, uh, yeah, so we, we train one teacher for each of these data points. And this is now an un ensemble. An ensemble means that, that these can together be used uh, to make predictions. And that is what, called, uh, what we call the aggregate teacher here. Uh, so the aggregate, uh, in this case, uh, is, is a voting of these n different teachers. So the teachers uh, get some data. Um, I don't know, where, where is the input? I didn't make this picture. Sorry? Yeah, that is, the, that is, that is the input for the training, yeah. Uh, but for the prediction, you can actually use this aggregate teacher for prediction. So I, I guess you could see the red part here, as you could input your, uh, you could input your your uh, data here as well. Uh, so so at, at at test time, you would have your data sent into each of these, and then they would vote, and that's that's the aggregate here. So they they do voting, and then we add some noise to the voting, uh, and this this kind of ensures. Um, so, for example, if this is performing a classification, they'd be uh, they'd be voting for one out of m classes, and uh, if if this is spread out evenly, um, um, then then that's sort of a problem, uh, because that may mean <coughs> may mean that that the one who has seen um, the correct answer will have some some sort of a um, or it's 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 um, the other way around, uh, if, if these are agreeing uh, for one specific class with just some, some of them voting for something else, then it's, it's easy to see the right answer. And it's also easy to see that, that the, the only teacher that has seen uh, this sensitive uh, data point, which we don't want to leak information about Jane Smith, right? Um, so the only teacher here who has seen Jane Smith uh, is not going to affect the output of the aggregate teacher uh, more than just just a little bit. So we want them to to agree because partly this means that we have generalized, but in practice it also means that that the output of the aggregate teacher is private. Now Hamid would say that what, what if, what if the, we have an adversary who can question, who can queer this for several times? Uh, wouldn't we run out of, of, uh, of uh, budget? Uh, there's no budget mentioned here. But if we question this over and over, uh, we may start to, to get some information about, about the voting here. And we get, may start to get some information about Jane Smith and whether she's in the data set or not. Uh, and this is why they have, this, uh, they have this line here. So we allow the, the adversary to see just the student. And the student is trained with new data. And that's what they call the incomplete public data here, uh, which is fed uh, through the aggregate teacher to get, uh, to get the training data. So they feed it through the aggregate teacher, 
Uh, so it's just fed once, and then the student is trained on this data. And uh, this is sort of a, of a nice way to, uh, to connect the generalization with the privacy properties. The generalization here, uh, we want these to generalize uh, so that it makes a similar prediction as the other ones on the data that they have seen and also on data that they haven't seen. And if they do, uh, we'll have really good prediction here. And if they don't, we'll just get, we'll just get a random out output because if, it's, if these uh, are really not agreeing, the noise will start to make uh, uh, play a role here. All right, let's go on. Um, so to recap a bit here, if we start to do overfitting, that means that we're probably learning to, to specific stuff. We're learning stuff that are specific in the training set. Nobody wants to do this because it means that we're, we're generalizing poorly. It also means that we have issues with privacy. We want to generalize, uh, and if we, if we do, this can actually make privacy a nice side effect. Using the Pate framework actually gives you some guarantees about this, about this privacy. So you can bound how much of the information that you actually leak from the data set while training. Okay, so I'll just wrap up with some final slides. And this is sort of a, of a, uh, of a teaser for John's talk this, this Thursday. Uh, so this is something that we work on in, in our group, uh, which is adversarial uh, representation learning. Um, and adversarial training sort of means that you have you have some adversary, or it's called discriminator often in, in, <clears throat> in um, literature. Uh, generative adversarial networks is sort of the, the most basic idea. You have just a generator and you have a discriminator. And uh, the generator starts to, do, to generate stuff, and in the beginning it's just random stuff. Uh, but the, uh, the adversary or the discriminator also sees real pictures and it's, it's, the adversary is trained to discriminate between real pictures and generated pictures. And uh, <clears throat> this way uh, has uh, turned out you can train a generative model to generate really nice looking photos in this way. Um, in our setting, uh, we, we instead we put some inputs into our model uh, the first part of the, of the generator is sort of the, the yellowish one here. <clears throat> the first part of it we call the filter. Uh, and the filter is trained to output something which is fed both to an adversary here and further to the latter part of the, of the generator. The adversary here uh, tries not to distinguish whether this is a real image or not, but it tries to dis distinguish one specific uh, sensitive attribute of the data. Uh, in our experiments, which I will show some preliminary results on in the next slide, uh, we have um, <coughs> we just arbitrarily picked uh, the smile of a person to be this sensitive data. We don't want to we don't want to show whether we're smiling or not. Um, so this adversary uh, looks at the data, uh, and and we know here that that whether a person is smiling or not. We have the tagged data. Uh, so the filter uh, outputs something, the adversary says, well, you're smiling. Uh, and then the filter is updating its parameters to, to sort of make it difficult for the adversary to say whether you're smiling or not. So the filter removes the sensitive data, sort of. And then this is fed further on uh, to the second part, where we put in a new secret. Well, here we're sampling, so this is also random, we're sampling this from the population density of smiles, which is sort of, it's close to 50-50 in this data set. Um, so half of the time we're telling this generator, well, generate a smile. 
And half of the time we tell it to, to generate a non-smile, whatever that means. Um, we also add some noise in some places. Uh, and we get some output. And we have this adversary uh, here. Um, and then we train this generator to become good at outputting a, an image that, that the adversary thinks is this synthetic secret. All right, and the idea here is that an image with this synthetic secret is even more private than, uh, than this image was, was just uh, transformed to become difficult for, for an adversary to, to determine, to determine uh, this feature. So specifically for smiles, uh, you'd imagine firstly that, that the, the mouth is, is involved in some way, uh, but when you think about it, also the eyes make changes when you smile. And, and, and when we start looking at the, these transformed images, you see that a lot of it is also in the, in the cheeks. You do a lot of things in your cheeks when you're smiling, apparently. Uh, so as in any uh, generative adversarial network related paper, uh, you need to include all, all loads of images, <laughs> which makes the, the PDF really, really hard to download. Uh, so these are some samples. They, these are, we promise they're not cherry picked. Uh, they are actually not. Um, <laughs> uh, these are just picked. Um, the first row is the input image. And the second row is the image where we have uh, tried to make an image where you're not smiling. So for this guy, you can see that he is smiling in the input and here, I'd say that, that, I don't know, if there is such a thing as a non-smile, I guess this is sort of it. In the final row, we, we instead generate uh, an image where you are smiling. So from this image where you're, I guess, not smiling, uh, to here where you're showing something that could look like teeth, I suppose, um, the point is that we can then sample uniformly from these two and we can output something that's, that's perhaps even more private than having something in between or something where we have hidden the, the uh, secret parts or something. Uh, yes, please. With the idea with this uh, augmented data that you should not be able to retrieve the input from the, the, the generated version. Yes, so, so, so the idea is that it should be similar to the input. Yeah, but, but there I'm may be features that, that um, s some user or some provider of the data don't want to, to expose, yes. Okay, but so from, from, the, from the generated mo model of the smile, I could identify that this smile belongs to in that input image. Yes. Yes, and that's, that's okay. But you cannot determine from the output, since these are sampled uniformly, you cannot really um, determine whether the input had a smile. Okay. That's, that's what we're sort of guaranteeing a pri uh, privacy about. Right, so uh, more about this on Thursday. Uh, it's just uh, almost the next door here. And uh, if you want to have some, some emails about invitations for our seminars, just holler or, or send me an email. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions. And I think they're coming in with Coke and Fanta and stuff. Uh, perhaps there will be some pizza in the end. I don't know. Uh, right? Questions? Is there an a scenario in which, I'm, I'm sure there is, uh, do you have examples of cases in which you try to hide, uh, because you, you need it for privacy, some information uh, with this method, but then uh, the, the, the final result is affected, and uh, how you can avoid that? Because maybe the smile is not uh, important mm. for, the, for the use of whatever you're going to use it for. Mm. But uh, how much can you can you hide uh, and not affect the final result, or is that is there a way to? Um, so, so the question is about how to how much can we 
How much do we know about the other properties of the image? Yes, so, so uh, by becoming a bit more technical about this, um, the model is trained with, with the, the objective here uh, with the reconstruction loss. And the reconstruction loss is actually a pixel-wise similarity. Um, so it's trained to, to have pixels that are similar to the input, pic uh, input pixels. Um, not sure I'm actually as answering a question right now. Because I no, think you're I after more, more what are other attributes of the image and what could be the correlations between those and the sensitive attribute or something yes, like that. Yes, and also like how much this can affect the output of uh, like uh, you could, uh, I guess that you could actually use this in any kind of domain in which you don't want to show if a person is smiling or not for some specific mm. reason, but, mm. uh, but if that could affect the, the final result. What is the final I result? Said. Yeah, I can't come up with examples because I would like yes. to get uh, But so for instance, if you use the augmented data to, to train a classifier to classify the difference between men and women, for instance, mm -hmm. yeah, and you use this this uh, this uh, method to generate the training data for that, mm -hmm. so does the augmentation affect the performance of the final Other parameters, yes. other women features. Women more, for mm -hmm. instance, statistically. Sure, sure. We have it. So yes. Uh, there are definitely correlations. Mm. Um, uh, I hope I'd have a good answer to that. Um, we will be investigating some, some of these, uh, how much we do affect. I mean, what you're saying is, is a direct dependency, and um, that is... Uh, that is sort of something that you could use to say that, well, I think this image has been tampered with. Mm. But I also think that we're not trying to hide that we are tampering with the images. We're opening, openly saying that, that we are changing the image and we are guaranteeing that the smile here is actually um, from this distribution instead of from the input. And, and uh, what we do see is, is it's really it really is difficult to, to predict the, the smile in the end. Um, but certainly, there, there, it's not going to be perfect because there are dependencies. And uh, I don't know, in this, uh, I guess final results will also show that, that what if we sort of um, turn this privacy uh, up a notch, and we do. We do the, 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 the in the in the end. Perhaps we'll we'll be starting to anonymize everything because because we cannot anon anonymize the smile without anonymizing the gender. Um, so we'll have to j just make everyone have not the gender as well. Thank you. Perhaps we'll see that when we when we go there. More questions? Yeah. Yep. It pretty much looks already like the classic random forest classifier. So is this random yes. forest already private by definition? Mm, no, because random forest uh, doesn't agree doesn't require you to, to partition your data in this way. You could it's definitely it's use a mean it's not necessarily dis dis disjunct, but it's still splitting up your data set in this uh, mm. Um, yeah, so, so I, I'd suppose that this reasoning may, may give you some, some belief in the privacy about that, because it's probably uh, one step towards privacy. Um, the, way, the way we do, do it here is, is actually something that give, can give you some sort of a proof of the privacy. It can give you some guarantee here. Um, I'd say... Well, you, I'm sure you can compute some bounds on it as well if you, if you perhaps give the, give the data point to two of these teachers or something like that. Um, so, so sure, there is a connection here. But you would not say that it makes the random forest automatically uh, confirming this privacy definition here? 
I don't think it fulfills all uh, as strong uh, privacy guarantees as this one. I don't think so. Uh, I think if you if you follow this architecture exactly, then I would say you probably get the exact same guarantees as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, is it uh, restricted to the human activities or is it to the any retail investment and to what extent? Is the I'm measuring the data which is mine, yes. for example, but uh, question is to what extent the monetization can be applied to any retail investment or to natural human object investment? Can it be applied to other data? Exactly. Other, other vision data. Other vision data, I'd say sure. Uh, we have so far we've just done this so th this is uh, this is definitely a work in progress um, we haven't shown that whether you can anonymize so is there a cow in this landscape or, or something like that is this car red um, yes yes no I I'd, I'd say um, adversarial representation learning is definitely something that we should look more into and people have have done similar stuff uh, uh, but they haven't sort of done this this last step which which we are doing by sampling a, a new smile sort of a synthetic smile for this one yeah. so we're currently writing up a paper uh, it will become available and the source code will become available too sure Shortly. Yes. More questions? Pizza is here. Pizza is here. So, so. <laughs>